Welcome to the bridge. It is great to have you. I'm going to sit for this beginning part of the bridge. We want to welcome you if you're online. Uh, welcome to the bridge. It's great to come and worship with you, obviously in person. Amazing to have you. Today is our second birthday. And I'll give yes. Uh, legitimately, October 6th is that day, but it's the first Sunday of October. And uh, man, I'll tell you what, two years Two years this has been, and we talk about it a lot, and I hope we can get past the verbiage, but going through a pandemic when you plant a church is not really, um, how do I say this, uh, in the manual of when you plant a church, how to do that. And so it's been a crazy moment in time, but so grateful for you and you online and for everybody who's a part of this ministry. And I want to say a couple of things. Um, Number one, um, we are blessed, Um, not only as a family, but we are blessed by a great God who was not surprised by what we've gone through over the last two years. Um, You know, people will say, well, that was the plan, right? Uh, I didn't know that was the plan, but I guess what I know is that God was in control of all of it at all times. And so I'm so grateful and honored by that. You'll also notice uh, being here on campus and coming into uh, the ministry center here, uh, things are starting to change. Uh, We had a week of painting Uh, You can see the entryway into uh, the ministry center expanded, so we made the doors wider, so we can have more people come in at one time, right? Yep, thumbs up. It's good. We even moved, if you're wondering, a bathroom door, so if you're used to where the bathroom door was inside the ministry center, it's been moved into the lobby, and so there's that piece if we just want to throw things out there to mess you up, to keep you on your toes. Um, There are more things coming as we continue to work on and put things together. But one of the key pieces of this ministry here at the bridge is a foundation of prayer. And Sean Tomei, a few weeks ago, really addressed and and spoke on that. Sean Tomei is a head of Expand Northwest, uh, the church planning organization to help lead the launch of the bridge. And so grateful for him and Expand and all of our partners But one of the things that Sean has ingrained within us in our DNA is to be a church of prayer. And in that, we have made that not only super important to us, but a foundational piece that when we found this piece of property to move into, the number one thing that we wanted to accomplish was put together a prayer room, a place where people can come and focus. And I want to let you know that that prayer room is like, what would you say? 90% done, it's really close, but it is ready to go, fully functional. But I want to speak into that here in just a moment. But here inside the worship center, and if you're here this morning, I want to encourage you to check it out at the end of the service. Um, Go see what that prayer room is like. I want to say a couple things about it. Number one, there is nothing holy about that prayer room. What I mean by that is it's not some special place that God resides only, right? Right? God resides within us. But the power of the prayer room is it's a place to focus. It's a place to kind of get away when the, from the distractions of the world and the things that are happening around us. That room has been designed specifically to help you focus in your communication with God. So I want to encourage you to look at it. I want to encourage you to use it. We're going to put out communication this week on how you can use it and when those times are available to be able to use that prayer room. But in essence, we want you to be able to use it when that works in your schedule. We're going to make it happen for you. And so very, very excited about that. So check that out at the end as well. So with that said, you should know a few things. Number one, there's an e-bulletin. That's how you stay in touch with the bridge and what's going on. Inside that e-bulletin, there's also a connect card. And that connect card, you can fill out and say, hey, I love what's happening in the bridge. I love what's going on here. I want to get connected. Fill that connect card out and uh, we'll be able to respond uh, back to you as well. With all of that said, let's pray. And then we got some singing to do, right? Yeah? All right, let's do it. Let's stand together. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we are so blessed uh, with this morning, with this opportunity to come and to worship, with this chance to be able to just be before the throne and say, thank you, God, for what you've done, not only uh, in our lives, but in this week. God, we come together as church, as called out people to worship you. And especially on Sundays when we come together for a service, this isn't the end all. This is really a moment where we get to celebrate the things that you've been doing all week. 
And we come together as community and celebrate those things. We become rejuvenated and then we go out and we continue to share the love of Jesus Christ within our communities. And so God, I pray that today would be a day of energy, a day that we kind of get those batteries a bit recharged and we look forward to coming before your throne and worshiping you. God, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Let's sing.
Would you please take a moment to greet one another? And if you're joining us online, please leave a note and let us know you're with us this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 is our key text for this morning. We're going to get to that here in just a few moments. Um, this new series that we're in uh, is uh, John's Gospel. John, uh, one of the synoptic gospels, the four gospels that we have in the New Testament that begin the New Testament. John comes to a unique place in describing who Jesus is. And one of the things that I love about where we're going is we at the bridge profess to be Jesus followers and disciple makers. But if we don't know who Jesus is and we don't understand what it means to make a disciple that follows Jesus, I mean, we gotta come to an understanding of who the guy is in the first place, right? The savior of the world, God himself. And so this morning, we're really gonna start with the foundation that John starts with when he talks about who Jesus is. And you've gotta understand these things in order to say, hey, I'm a Jesus follower. And this is who God's called called for us to follow. And, and, and he's also, right, the savior of the world. And so when we say those things, we get it, we know it, but what does that really mean? Well, John does an outstanding job of describing and kind of telling us who Jesus Christ is. But I need to start with this first foundation. You have to believe in the Bible. The Bible is the inspired written word of God. If you look at the Bible and you read it and go, well, it's just a bunch of stories and stuff, then this isn't going to mean anything to you. You've got to start with that first piece, this piece, this word of God that I found my life on, that I stand upon is true. It is God breathed. It is his communication to us. And so with that said, you know, we live in a world today that is full of skeptics. And we live in a world today that, you know, uh, questions so many things. And I think sometimes it's really good for us to ask questions, not sometimes. It is. But it's also good to come to facts and come to understanding. And I got to tell you what, anytime a skeptic comes around and tries to disprove the word of God, you find that, that, that those facts that they fall on aren't true. And you find always over and over again that the word of God is the word of God, it is God breathed, it is true, it is reliable, and it is something that you can found your life upon. And so with that, just a brief moment in that, I wanna, I wanna show you a few things. Uh, this, um, I wanna begin by showing you some pictures of four movies, all right? Now, we have a diverse age group of people in here. So some of them you're gonna be like, oh yeah, I get it. And some of you will be like, well, I've heard of it, right? Gone with the wind. Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara, right? All right, so there's one picture. Here's the other one uh, for all of you Star Wars junkies. Return of the Jedi, right? C-3PO, R2-D2, Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, 
My favorite, Princess Leia. Love it all, right? Return of the Jedi, right there. All right, here's the third picture. The Grinch who stole Christmas. Yeah? Jim Carrey, the Grinch. We all know it. Yeah? Here's the fourth picture. The Chronicles of Narnia. Have you guys seen that movie? Long time ago. Seems like a long time ago. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Lucy, Susan, and Peter. You recognize these pictures because either you've seen the movie or you know something about them, right? Some of you are sitting in here going, I've heard of them, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Return of the Jedi. Who's never seen a Star Wars movie in here? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I knew there were people like that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Peter, that's your task now to get them on board with you two, both of you and Ethan. Get them, they got to watch these Star Wars movies, right? Uh, Gone with the Wind. How many have seen Gone with the Wind? How many have seen Gone with the Wind? How many have not seen Gone with the Wind? <laughs> I have not. It's not one of those things in my repertoire of things I want to, you know, be a part of see. But anyways, these movies, though, we all know of them, and some of us have seen them, and some of us understand the whole plot. But if you didn't know anything about these movies, could you figure out the story from a single picture? Go back to the... Go back to the Return of the Jedi one. Can you find that one real quick? Because I'm just going to appease Peter on this. If you look at that picture, can you tell me the story of Return of the Jedi? Teddy bears. Teddy bears. <laughs> Cute. And uh, droids, right? Robots. Yeah. Robots. Funny looking people. Yeah. All right. You can take it off. Go back to the other slide, right? Um, obviously not. You can't look at a picture and go, oh, I know the story. I know the movie. I know this, the plot. I know everything about this thing, right? All we have here in each of these pictures is one moment in time from the movies that lasts around, these movies last around two hours. A good Star Wars movie could last four hours, it seems like sometimes. So there's that. Um, we can make up, though, anytime you see a picture, you can make up almost any story to go with them. You can look at that, and you can make up any story that you want. So from a single picture, we don't know how the story begins or how the story ends. We don't know who's good, and you don't know who's bad. The point that I really want to make in this, though, is it's the same about Jesus. You can't make sense of his life by only looking at one brief moment in time. And this is where John comes into play because John is such an, uh, an integral part of the life of Jesus that John gives us an array of the story from the beginning to the end. But we know this in today's world. And I'm just gonna give you some things you know, right? People make judgments about Jesus from their one and only event or maybe a statement that has been said or heard. People will go, oh, well, I know who Jesus is because I've seen or I've heard one certain thing about him. And even though there are a few monumental events in the life of Christ, like his birth, his transfiguration, his crucifixion, or maybe even his resurrection, each event is incomplete without the entire story, right? So you look at it and go, oh yeah, Jesus was born of a virgin. And that's all you know? Oh, okay, okay. Well, now, you know, I know that that's a crazy story and that this guy was born of somebody who, you know, you're like, that's weird. Like, you don't know the story, right? You only know one piece of the story. Like Jesus, um, he died on the cross, right? And then he was buried and he rose again. That's really cool. I've never heard of that happening before. But, oh, well, I mean, great. That, that guy rocks. But what does that do for me, right? Um, as we begin this series... God has moved into our neighborhood. And as we begin to unfold the story of Jesus, we need to ask ourselves a question. Where's the best place to begin a story? Where's the best place? Because if we want to know the whole story, there's got to be a start to the story. And the start of a story plays a huge role into the entire story itself. When we look at the four Gospels, we see that each of them started the story in a very different place. Think about it. Go through all of them. Uh, Ma uh, go through Mark. The Gospel of Mark begins the story of Jesus with the ministry of John the Baptist, who prepares the way for Jesus. 
Matthew begins his story with the genealogy of Jesus and traces his ancestry back to Abraham. And then he moves right into the birth of Jesus. The gospel of Luke begins with the foretelling of the birth of John the Baptist. And then once Luke gets to the genealogy of Jesus, he traces his ancestry all the way back to Adam. There's reasons why each of them start their gospels that way. But in vivid contrast to those three stories of Jesus, the gospel of John does not begin with an earthly story of Jesus. Rather, it begins with an eternal story of Jesus. Yep, Jesus was a person who lived at one uh, was a person who lived at one particular time in history just like the rest of us, but Jesus is far greater and here's John's point as he starts this whole gospel. Jesus is far greater and more important than the rest of us because Jesus has an existence that precedes his earthly existence. So to really understand and appreciate Jesus, to understand who he is when we say we're a Jesus follower and we're to be disciple makers, we've got to know the whole story. And the story begins this way. If you have your Bibles with you, stand with me as we read this. It's in John chapter one, all right? John chapter one, verses one through five. And if you're online with us, I hope you're following along. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can follow, follow along with us here as well. It will come up on the screen for you uh, as we read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we, we walk into this gospel of John and we see that this story that John writes begins with in the beginning, before time, as we know it, Jesus was. And I pray that God is as we walk through this gospel, as we spend time in this good news, that we come to not only an appreciation of how much you love us, but God, an all-in dedication that says we are believers, we are all in with you, and we are giving our lives to you. And we are also living that out in a broken, busy, and lost world. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right. So you may be seated. So we've got to create some foundation here. So it's going to be a, a little bit of study before we even get into some of the wonderful teachings of Jesus. But to understand why John shows us a certain picture of who Jesus is, the story of Jesus, right? The beginning to the end, we've got to understand what John's trying to do and who he's painting Jesus to be and who Jesus was. So we have evidence that Jesus pre-existed, okay, before he became you and I. Before he was us, Jesus still was. So what does that look like? Let's look at the evidence, right? You start with the first part of John chapter one, verse five. We saw that. John says, the word was where? The, by the way, the word is Jesus himself. That, that's how John's referring to Jesus, the word. So where was the word? Look at it real quick. Where was the word? With God, right? In the beginning. And the word and the word was what? Right out of the gate, John says, hey, this guy, this guy who you're gonna give your life to, who you're gonna follow, who's gonna create the boundaries of life for you, who's gonna help you live alive in a full. By the way, this dude was at the beginning, he created everything. Oh, and by the way, this guy is God himself. Okay, that's a massive statement to make, isn't it? It's massive for John to be able to say. So who's the word? Well, in verse 14, John identifies the word saying, so if you, we'll look at this even more fully next week, but uh, verses 14 through 15, the word became flesh. So he's defining who the word is, right? And made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only who came from the father, full of grace and truth. 
I love that. But he's identifying very quickly, Jesus is God who's become human. And now you wanna know where we get the title of our series, God has moved into the neighborhood. I spoke about this a little bit last week, Eugene Peterson in his paraphrase of the scriptures. This is the verse it comes from, verses 14 and 15, but really verse 14 where Eugene Peterson in the message writes it this way. The word Jesus became you and I, flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. God moved into our neighborhood. God says, I'm not just gonna be a God that's out here. I'm gonna be a God who's intimately involved in your world. I'm gonna be in your neighborhood. I'm gonna know when you're mowing the lawn, right? I, I've told this story before, but when I li lived in Tennessee, I loved mowing the lawn because my neighbor would come out and always bring me sweet, uh, sweet tea and cherry pie. So that's why I mow the lawn like three days a week, right? Just gained all this weight doing that. But I loved it. And I love that because we moved into, the, into a neighborhood and everybody became friends. We, be, we came to know each other. That was a thing of the South, man. If you're in the South and you're in the neighborhood, you got to know your neighbors. You all became friends. This, this issue, this thing where we move into neighborhoods now and we don't know who the people are that are, uh, live around us, that's not the way it used to be at all. I love, uh, there's a, a gentleman sitting in the front row here. I will not say his name, Narciso. Uh, Narciso, you are amazing. He, um, he's been challenged in his own life in what it looks like to reach out to neighbors and to speak to them. And you know what? It's massive what God can do when you just say, I'm gonna open myself up to what God wants me to do, to God moments. Anyways, I digress, but God moves into our neighborhood. And so we discover that the word is Jesus, right? So as John began his gospel, he begins by telling us that in the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. Therefore, Jesus' existence didn't begin at this birth of Virgin Mary. Jesus was an agent of creation, right? So you gotta get this foundation. Okay, so this is the guy that we're gonna follow. This is the guy I'm gonna give my life to. He's the bridge right, between my life now and the creator, God himself, who is he? John says, Jesus is the creator, God himself. But in addition to being there in the beginning, we see that, right, Jesus is an agent of creation. John declares this, verse one, uh, chapter one, verse three. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Interesting. Jesus is this incredible creator, this incredible person who put all of the intricate pieces together of the world that we live in today. He knows, he knows how your body functions. He knows how the sun rises and how the sun sets. He knows how the, the trees bloom and then the, those leaves die and they turn beautiful colors and fall to the ground and then we have to clean them up, right? You know, he knows all of that. He knows how this whole thing works because he created it. But it wasn't just John who said this. Paul said it in Colossians chapter one, verses 15 through 17. Paul said this, he is the image of the invisible God, Jesus is, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. So let me stop there. Did you catch that? What kind of things has Jesus been involved in when it comes to creation? I mean, that's a pretty expansive list, isn't it? I mean, absolutely everything you see, Jesus has been a part of. Jesus is the one who said, I created all of those things and the rulers and the authorities and everybody, yep, I have been intricately involved in all of those things. My hand is in all of that. He is the creator and he was before all things and both things point to Jesus's eternal nature. The writer of Hebrews began his letter in these words. It's all over scripture. 
Hebrews chapter one, verses one through two. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Everything. Kind of get the point, right? Jesus has been a part of all of this from the beginning. So from those verses, we discover that Jesus' preexistence precedes the creation of all things. Not only do these New Testament passages speak of Jesus' role in creation, there's also evidence in the Old Testament. So if you're like, oh, well, that's what the New Testament says. Well, guess what? The Old Testament speaks into who Jesus is. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word for God that appears here is the word Elohim. Elohim. It's a really interesting word, but I'm going to give you the plural noun meaning of it means mighty ones. A family acting as one. We see that the God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one in the same, working together. Yes? So God has chosen to express his personal nature in the terms of a family relationship of equal personalities, equaling that one God. That's why in Genesis 1, 26, you read this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our own likeness. In Genesis 3, 22, and the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And in Genesis 11, we see that after the flood, the people were all staying in one place and pride was becoming a problem. So God said, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Here's the point in all of that. We see these instances when God describes himself in the plural. There's a group, there's a fit, we're three. There's a group of us that are doing this together. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus made tons of other statements uh, throughout scripture that talks about his preexistence. Uh, John six sixty two, what if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before? John eight fifty eight. I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I was. The reason why I'm giving you all of this drudgery is it brings a point to who Jesus is and what John's trying to do in this gospel. If Jesus had been born thousands of years after Abraham, how is it that he was existing before Abraham was born? In fact, John the Baptist and others, you know, they speak into this over and over and over again. Obviously, Jesus knew where he had been and what his glory had been like. Let me give you this last scripture and we'll move on to the next point. Philippians chapter two, Paul writes this. Listen to his words. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. If we're going to be a Jesus follower and a disciple maker, Paul says your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is where I would typically get super hyped up and like get you going. Because this is unbelievable news. We have just gone through a whole load of scripture, and I didn't even give you all of the scriptures that are in in, in the Bible, where God says, where it is pointed out very clearly, Jesus is God. Jesus preexisted before all of this. Jesus created you and I. He created all of the things that we have around us. He is the one who put this all together, yet he humbly came to this earth put on the form of humankind, went through pain, agony, suffering, joy, laughter, peace, all of death. Why? Why would the guy who created all of this subject himself to those things? He 
because he loves you. And he knew there's this gap in this relationship. And he says, man, I love you so much. I don't want this gap to be, I don't want this gap to exist. So I'm going to become a bridge that bridges the gap between my father and you. That's good news. That's why John starts his gospel, the good news, in this way. To let you know how amazing Jesus is, who he is, and then how much of a servant he really is, and how much he loves you, which is why he did what he did. That's, that's where he's going in this, right? So, the significance of Jesus' pre-existence, the significance is this. First and foremost, Jesus' pre-existence proves that he is God, As God, we know that we can trust him and that his promises are true. As God, we know that he has the power to help us and to save us. I think you would also agree with me that that's pretty important stuff. But second, Jesus' preexistence shows that he cares for you and I. Our God is not a God, as some deists will claim, that created the world, wound it up, and set it off into space to run without God's attention. Our God is a God who takes an intense interest in the creation that he formed himself. Right? Our God is a God who loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And if Jesus did not care, he would never have come to this earth leaving the glory of heaven. And he certainly would not have subjected himself to the abuse and suffering of crucifixion if he didn't love us. Why in the world would he do that, right? Our eternal God stepped into time and space so that we might know him and inherit eternal life through him. That's worth an amen. That's where the name end, because that's who God is. God says, I love you that much, right? I love you that much that this is what I'm doing here. And John's revealing that in this gospel. He really does love us, and his kindness ought to lead us, lead us to repentance. Okay, so third, Jesus' preexistence means, now I don't know where you are in this, but that there is a plan. I love plans. How many guys like plans? Okay, so when you go on vacation, so let's do this. When you go on vacation, do you like to have a plan when you go on vacation? Yes, raise your hand. Okay, if you, how many of you don't care, you wanna go wherever the wind blows? Ethan, yes, okay, good, good. Yes, good thing you guys are all married to people who are planners because your vacations would go screwy, right? So we've done that though. Uh, Steph and I, well, I love a plan. In fact, uh, my kids, um, Matt, both Madison, Kate, and Joel, and even Scott and Colin, they'll, they'll ask these questions. But when we get to a certain place, they go, what's our plan for the day? Because they know dad's a, a guy of plans, right? So it just brings us peace and comfort. We know kind of where we're going and what we're doing and where we're staying and how we're going to make this happen and all of that kind of stuff, right? And sometimes they get a little out of sorts when I go, there is no plan. Now, let me tell you this. My wife, God bless her, I love her to death, She's not necessarily a planner. She doesn't like to make those decisions. So on one of her birthdays here a few years ago, woke up in the morning, and my wife, as she commonly will ask in the morning, what's the plan for the day? And I said, baby, it's your birthday. We get to do whatever you want to do. And you know what she did? Oh, no. No, 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 no. I do not want to make decisions. I don't want to do this, right? She was, she was like nutting up because of it. She's like, I, I need a plan. I don't want to make the plan. Well, what I love about God is he says, you might be a little uh, disconcerted if you feel like you want to make the plan. Guess what? I've got a plan. Jesus came from glory and wants to bring you and me into that glory. He wants us to be in a relationship with him. In fact, Jesus said in John 17, said this, Father, I want those you have given to me to be with me where I am and to see my glory and the glory that you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. The love of God and the plan of God have been in place before the creation of the world. Peter explains it in 1 Peter 1. 
For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver and gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Man, that is such good news. God's plan has been in place forever and it was an expensive plan. This is not some cheap run of the mill ah, Walmart plan, Bymart plan. I'm going with Bymart because I just heard you start shop at Bymart. My parents shop at Bymart. Mom and dad love you. Got your little member number. That's awesome. Joking. This is a plan. This is a, an expensive Nordstrom's type of plan. All right? This thing is really expensive to the point that it costs a life. It costs the life of his son. John wrote in 1 John chapter 4, this is how God showed his love among us, that he sent his one and only son into the world that he might live through him. This is love. This is expensive love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice, a bridge for our sins. And this life that God wants to give us is more glorious than anything we could have ever imagined. I love it. First Corinthians, Paul writes this. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. It's wonderful. I mean, it's super incredible stuff. So as I kind of wrap it up, as we strive to see Jesus ever more clearly, we begin with a glimpse of his preexistence. And that's what John's doing in this gospel. Let me show you that God's always been. Let me show you that Jesus has always been. Let me show you that Jesus has created everything. Let me show you that Jesus not only created everything, but Jesus always had a plan. This plan has always been for you. And that plan is very, very expensive. Because now at the end of this, knowing that Jesus has always existed, he's, always, he's created everything, he's put everything in motion, and now you know the end of the story, right? He dies on the cross for you and I, and he rises again and he conquers death. By the way, that tells you, that makes you come to a better understanding of the story and who Jesus Christ is. And I can't wait to fill in the middle pieces because that's what really paints the life of Jesus and who we are as Jesus followers. Before he ever put a foot on this earth, Jesus was alive and well. He was reigning with God in all of, the, all of their glory. He was creating and sustaining all things. His preexistence is so important because it proves that he is God. It proves that he, that he cares for us. And it means that there is this amazing plan that God has set in place. And as John completes the first five verses of this kind of this beginning part of the story, John says this, in him was life and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness doesn't get it. It doesn't understand it. A couple of weeks ago, I played golf in the night, at night. Uh, it's kind of a unique moment. Uh, anybody play golf around here? Anybody? Nope. Nobody plays golf. Come on. Change your life. No, just kidding. Um, so, okay. So you haven't played, you don't really play golf, right? Maybe online you guys are like, yep, play golf a ton. Good. You guys are going to heaven. Otherwise you guys. Um, okay. So you haven't played golf. Can you imagine trying to play golf at night? Like finding the clubs that you want and finding the ball and you hit the ball in the air and then you got to go find the ball. Well, we play glow ball. So there's actually golf balls that glow in the dark. 
right? It's so cool. It's like tracers flying through the air, by the way. When you hit a golf ball, you look all over the golf courses, they're flying all over the course. It's really, really cool. Super cool too when it hits a tree. That's what happens when I play. Hits a tree and then you see it bounce all the way down the tree, like one of those Plinko game things, whatever that is. It's amazing. Well, anyways, I digress. So in this, my son Cade, we're playing in this glow ball event and my son Cade goes, well, we would have flashlights out there so we could see things and we would actually flash the flashlight on the grass so we could kind of see where we were swinging our club. And my son goes, I don't want a flashlight. I want my eyes to acclimate to the dark. I'm like, dude, that's not gonna work. He's like, yeah, it's gonna work. By the way, my kid's an engineer. He thinks he knows it all. You know, you know these type, right? These engineering types who think they know it all. Um, so he's like, within the first couple of holes, he's trying to do this. Within the third hole, he's like, dad, I need a flashlight. <laughs> yeah, I know, buddy, because you stink right now, right? <laughs> It's so hard to hit a golf ball when it's pitch dark outside. You can't see it and you don't know where it's going. And a lot of times when you do it without light, you hit it in such a way that it shanks it. A shank or would be, it goes straight right or it goes straight left, completely off course. But when the light was shown on that golf ball, my son hit it straight and so far in the boundaries of the golf course. And man, did we play golf from then on out. In this text, you find there at the end of this, right? Uh, in verses four and five, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness. It allows you to be able to live within the boundaries that God's created. It allows you to live more fully alive. Because of Jesus, it allows you to live in such a way that you find incredible strength and power and to be able to live free from really the, the stuff that's been keeping you back. It allows you to live alive. But sadly, so many people resist the life and the light that Jesus offers. John wrote this in verse 12. Yet to all who received him, to all who believed in his name, and let me stop there. You're gonna get this reminder every week. When we see the word believe, a good full definition of that word is what? You remember from last week? All in, you are awesome. All in. All in, yet to all who received him, to all those who are all in, in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's good news. And this morning, uh, we're gonna take communion, which is the epitome of the good news. If you don't have your juice and bread, I wanna encourage you. You're gonna, I'm gonna give you a moment. You can walk over there. They're on the table over there. You can grab uh, some grape juice and some bread. If you're online, I wanna encourage you to grab some bread and juice. Uh, this is good news. This is what light does. This is what Jesus does. This is God in human form who said, I love you this much that I'm going to break my body, I'm going to shed my blood so that you won't be lost, broken, or hurting anymore. Because I'm gonna bring healing and peace and salvation to you. Because by the way, Jesus says, I've always had a plan. I've always had a plan. And so right now, if you're in the middle of stuff, I need you to hear me say, God's got a plan. You're okay. We're celebrating our second birthday here at the bridge. We went through a pandemic. That stunk. That's not cool. That is not in the plans. I didn't like any piece of that. And I don't like where we're still having to go through because I get it, it's horrible. But God says, I got a plan. 
that plan has been enacted. It, has been, it is happening right now because I'm fully engaged. I'm fully involved. I'm fully a part of your life and I'm here to bring you healing. I'm here to bring you life and I'm here to bring you peace. Will you just be all in like I have been with you? That should cause you to celebrate. That should cause you to bring peace and to say, you know what? I'm good. I'm gonna follow him because he's the light in the darkness and he will guide me to where I need to go so I don't go astray in the trees or in the bushes or in the water like that golf ball did for my son. Eh, maybe me a couple of times too. But that light brings life and it brings direction. So this morning, I wanna encourage you to take communion, get things back on track, trust in him. By the way, we're gonna have a conversation with one of our kiddos here over the next few weeks who came to us and he said, hey, you know what? I, I think I wanna get baptized. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna learn more about what it means to be a Jesus follower. We have a, 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 a kind of a class called Joining God's Family. And uh, we're gonna take our kiddos through that. And uh, I, I love that walk that people go through when they say, I wanna follow Jesus. Man, if you're here today or if you're online, you say, I, I wanna get on track. I wanna follow Jesus. Let us help you do that. We wanna pray with you. We wanna help you take those next steps. And maybe you are a Jesus follower and just things aren't going well. Let us know. Let us pray with you. Let us walk with you. Let us be beside you as we do that, as you do that and we do it together. So with that, let's take communion. I'm gonna give you a few moments to do that and then I'll wrap us up in prayer before we sing one last song. Father, we are just so humbled by you. Yeah, uh, God, when we go through the scripture, there's a lot of back story, a lot of things that we've got to understand and, and, and acknowledge and hold on to, to really understand the story that's played out through John. By beginning, by seeing the beginning of the gospel and even seeing how John wrote concerning Jesus being at the very beginning, it, it creates a foundation and an understanding for us to know that you've always been there. You've always been a part. And even in the darkest moments of our lives, when we question where you are, you're there. Because we can hold on to the truth that you were there at the beginning and you'll be there to the end. And Father, I pray that in that, uh, we may be able to find peace in this. We might be able to find strength in this. And that God, we would be people that not only um, would be uh, incredible disciples that follow you with passion and grace and love, but we would be contagious people that would be able to share this light in a very dark world that would become attractive. That when people hear the name of Jesus, they know that he's famous, 
not because he healed people and not because he rose from the dead and not because he was born of a virgin or just the little isolated pieces of the story, but God, that they would see the entire story lived out through us as people of grace and people of love and people of mercy and people of truth. Thank you, Father, for providing life, for creating us, for our relationship that we have with you. We will give you our lives. We are all in. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand and join us for one last song?
All right, well, you're going to stay standing for just a moment because we are going to celebrate our second birthday so she can bring the cake up here without the candles blown out. By the way, we've had a long conversation about this. We are not going to blow the candles out due to COVID, so we'll be very safe about this. But I still wanted to have a cake with a couple of candles on there, right? You got this tighten in on the camera shot right there, not on us, right there. Hey, it is our second birthday, and uh, we're going to do something goofy. We're going to sing happy birthday. So uh, <laughs> it is worth celebrating. It's worth doing. We've made it a two, and now we go into our terrible twos. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so excited for the next year. So um, let's sing. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear the bridge church at Northwest. Happy birthday to you. Yay! That is so cool. Um, if you're online, you don't get any cake. See, that's what you're missing. So maybe next time you come to church, right? No, it's great. It's great to have you. But if you're here, we're going to eat some calories. We're going to have some cake here in just a moment. What a blessing it is to be able to worship with you today. May God bless you this week in incredible ways. And we look forward to coming back together and worshiping next Sunday again. God bless. Happy birthday, The Bridge. Woo! Still faithful to the living.